And by the way, when, when Europeans are fighting and they're killing each other, who cares? How many people have died so far in Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis how many people have died in Congo so far? It's not worth talking about. So I, I'm, I'm personally not moved. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the African people coming together, creating our own army, creating our own economy, creating our own solidarity as brothers and sisters so that we can be able to deal with African problems and not wait for foreigners to come and solve those problems for us. Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. Welcome back to this channel, your favorite channel, the channel of choice. Zigo and Se Kundai Podcast. We are so much grateful for the support you are giving. Our numbers are moving significantly both on YouTube and Facebook. And today we are back again with Mama Ponga, Joshua Marara. And first, we'd like to thank you for the support you are giving. Uh, the numbers, they are moving, moving. And uh, the kind of conversations that we are having, I think they are really quality conversation. We are hosting Shekiti Mburwa on the controversial I am more gifted than God topic, <laughs> which Prophet Makandiwa had made. Welcome, say. No, thank you very much. And maybe just a small little highlight for, for viewers. Mm. Democracy must always encourage robust debates. Yes. We don't have gather around ourselves people who always say what we want to hear yes. and then become undertakers into the funeral parlor of intelligence there, there should be a way of even disagreeing with someone but disagree in a respectable way share your view also you know just say benzi benzi i also want to learn and grow benzi qualify then we grow together and I think maybe that's what that means. Social media is very nice, but unfortunately, it's, it always wants to ride on what everyone else says. But you're doing a good job, I must say. I'm quite encouraged. I've seen also your growth. The quality of your interviews is improving, the quality of your guests is also improving. And uh, I think you're on, you're on your way up. You will make it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hans. When you sit down at the feet of the elders, you learn a lot. Someone was actually commenting and saying, You should go and hang around with your peers. <laughs> <laughs> Those of your age. Munukaruga Mama Sticker. Ugaida hang around Nama age means I go too much. You end up sticking in the unun. Munukaruga Maida Sam Soro. It is hang around people that can encourage you and help you to grow and become a better person. I think let us just dive into today's topic. If you are watching this video, you can actually see that behind me there is President Ramaphosa, there is President Putin. There is also President Zelensky. The Russia-Ukraine war. We really don't want to look into the dynamics of who is wrong, what should be done, uh, America or what, what. But we really want to look at, just to give a review of the visit that were made by African heads of states to Ukraine and Russia on a peace-finding mission. For the start, what do you think about that visit? I think the visit is, is quite immature, to say the, the least. The visit demonstrated that it does not have diplomatic equality between Africa and Europe. The visit comes in totally being a disorganized visit, in that the intentions of the visit are earmarked by the already precipitating misunderstanding between South Africa, BRICS, and, and, the, and the American space. The visit, by its own, becomes a hypocrisy of the highest order. Because as we speak right now, South Africa is, is on fire. There, there's lots of problems on the domestic level. Without being too judgmental, there's lots to do at home than to do afar. And next door, Congo's war, ever since civilization started, there's not a single day that has gone past and someone has not died in Congo. That war has been you know, precipitating for a very long time. South Sudan, the other day, burst into war. Djibouti is bursting into war. Eritrea and Ethiopia is almost subsiding, to mention but a few. Over and above that, the, 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 the people that are in, in, uh, in Russia to speak to Zelensky, the question is, why did they even meet with each other to solve domestic problems at an African level? So my first response would be, Maybe before you can start uh, fixing someone else's house next door, uh, how about fixing your own home? You know, before you start running around Europe trying to fix American problems. And to say the least, the African president, I don't think that they are fully equipped to deal with European conflicts 
because these conflicts are not as superficial as we think they are. They run deep into centuries, and the history of these wars needed a much more you know, united Africa towards dealing with that, rather than a few ministers, a few presidents running around in trying to show the world that they are pro-peace. I found that to be very hypocritical. I wasn't impressed personally. The submissions that were made by President Ramaphosa there, you would see that at the core of their visit, the objective was to address the issue of food, that the war is actually affecting Africa. We no longer have food because of this war. We can't have wheat because of the war. Someone would argue in that line that we rely on food that comes from Ukraine and the war is actually affecting us. The man who feeds you rules you. Zimbabwe, as of um, three months ago, four months ago, we met our wheat quota. What does that mean? It means that for the next 13 months to 16 months, by the time we finish the winter harvest now, I think we'll have, we'll have been able to peg our wheat harvest to almost two years of not importing a single grain of wheat into the country. Food is a weapon. Food can be used for warfare. So maybe let's cut it straight as you rightfully put it, that they didn't go there to look for a peace treaty. They went there to secure their breakfast tables in terms of looking for money, looking for pizzas, looking for bread for breakfast. So maybe it had nothing to do with war except to say stop the war so that Ukraine can continue to plow. But do you need to go to Ukraine to tell them to plow when you have vast lands in South Africa? You have vast lands in, in Zambia and in Zimbabwe, where right now, if we say we have 13 months of wheat in the country, we can give South Africa six months worth of wheat instead of doing business between Ramaphosa and Amazon Munangagwa right across the border at Bay Bridge. Hey, please give me some extra electricity. I'll give you some wheat. People who fly across the world to some lands we don't even know in Donetsk, in Kiev, right in the book to go and negotiate for food. And I think, to, to say the least, it's, embar it's embarrassing that you'd, you'd rather go beg for someone to plow for you when you are sitting on your own land, which you cannot utilize. And I even saw that China has stopped the importing maize from America and thought that they can just import it from South Africa, which is relatively nearby. And, and I think maybe the, our African leaders needed also to look at the dynamics of the era we are now moving into. The, the era of the Robert Mugabe's, the Kenneth Kaunda's, the Julius Nyerere's has, has gone past. That politics, which is heavily dependent on Europeans, they've built up universities. We've gone to school. We have studied. All we need are means of production. So that instead of just giving farms to each other as trophies and as gifts for liberation struggles, as gifts for political reasons or whatever reason it is, these pieces of land must be given and utilized by those who know how to work on the plots, work on the farm. Because if we are not careful to utilize our land and plow and plant our own food, we will constantly become slaves. Because once you are starved, you will beg for life. And a hungry stomach does not know politics. And I'm even thinking, these are thoughts that are just coming into my head, that if Zimbabwe has demonstrated capacity to provide wheat and actually have a surplus, and African nations are failing to do that, why can't we do, as even Southern Africa, just to do maybe a crowdfund? We work on a project of wheat in Africa, in Zimbabwe. We start from level one, we start supplying southern africa we know that if we have got needs of wheat instead of going to ukraine and trying to solve a war there what would stop us from doing something like that it's, it's a two-way and i want to say the first one in a very sarcastic way but very truthful way uh, this second republic will shock many people will shock many people because in the midst of the much complaints that people are saying on the top side if you just look at the two weeks ago, a week ago last week when Comrade Munangagwa opened up the fifth dam in, 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 in within two years. They've been able to build five dams. It has not happened in the history of this country. And if you look at the catapult dominal effect of the availability of water, if you look at the fields that have been plowed in Chivu there and, and the amount of agriculture that has gone there, you, you, you drop, you drop. So slowly, the, this second republic is, is investing into the right things.
Yes, few elements here and there still need to be uprooted. I don't mix my words. It's true. When an organization gets old, it also acquires old habits. But on the NDS1 project itself, I find that there is beautiful movement in terms of securing food and making that readily available to all. Number two, even if we're going to be plowing wheat, I don't want to be too, too excited about wheat. We must be asking the second question, who is supplying the seed for the wheat? Is this genetic? Is this organic? Because in as much as we have developed appetite for food, for, for, for bread and pizzas, let's not forget Mbambaira, Mabura, Mashakada, Chinguachamabagwe, and some of the indigenous foods that we had. Because in the event the season does not allow us to have enough wheat, we can still fall back on our indigenous tables and have a good breakfast and remain as healthy. So now it almost looks like bread is a staple of food for Zimbabwe. But the question is, since when have we depended on wheat as a means of surviving? How many people in Zimbabwe have a loaf of bread every morning? In our days, without mixing words, we used to eat bread only at Christmas. Once in a year, but we were healthy. So it's not only about wheat, maybe. Let us look at a full agricultural outfit. That includes the small seeds, our legumes, to supplement our diet. And we need from the Department of Health to, throughout Africa to campaign for indigenous seeds to be planted so that there could be enough food. Let these other extra breads and pizzas become luxuries when people have money to spend. But for health and welfare, let's remember that our organic indigenous foods have been with us here for thousands of years before this wheat came in the name of the colonial bread. Yeah, but when many young people, even like me, when we look at indigenous foods, taking them as an alternative, we actually think that we are reversing in time. We are actually going backwards instead of moving forward to modernization. Little education is dangerous. When you get to places and you study and you learn about healthful living, you, you will start learning lots of ugly things. That America can give Africa fertilizer, but when they want to buy food from Africa, they want to buy organic. They, they, they sell you GMOs and they are buying from you organic. What is that saying? So that you must eat junk, poisonous foods, and while they're eating organic. So maybe we need, a, hence I'm saying that we need to start a campaign of uh, making our indigenous foods popular. I'm very excited in Harare right now. There is Gawa there, there is Garwe there. If you get to the taxi ranks there, you find Mazondo and Harare, Nyamanumribo, some beautiful, beautiful diets. And I just wish that our holiday inns, our rainbow towers and big hotels, the Crestas, can begin also to create, not only once a week, on a Thursday, we do indigenous foods only mm. on Thursday, Friday, it must actually become normal. It is it is sickening to walk up into an African hotel and then you are served an English breakfast. <laughs> Myself, I'm not well. Uh, I'm not well traveled. In fact, I've never traveled. But when I can watch movies or just to see online, you'll see Caribbean resorts. You get Caribbean food and all the sorts. There is some relevance of the type of food that you get with the location of where you are going. But well. Without looking like we are diverting from the topic, what is really the place of Africa in global politics? What is our place? Because we see the place of America, it's very, very clear. They defined themselves as the big brother. They defined themselves as the superpower. Of course, China, Russia, UK, Commonwealth. What is the place of Africa or at least the African Union in global conflict? There are two things that are happening on the table. One is the one sitting on the table Yes. And one is the one who is on the menu. So there are those who are eating the menu, and there are those who are the menu. And uh, Ruto captured it well the other day when he says Africa has decided now to come onto the table. And I think for too long, we need to understand that Africa has been working as a primary industry you know, continent where basically we are raw material producers and we sell our raw materials as they are. Europe and China have moved themselves into the secondary markets where they are able to clean up these minerals and draw the, separate them, and then steel is here, magnesium is here, 
and etc. Then the tertiary one is where you're not able to convert these minerals into gadgets, into cell phones, into cars, into computers, into clothes, into etc. So Africa needed to, 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 to redefine herself. That will she continue as a primary industry economy? Because in a primary industry economy, it's always about plow some more, dig some more, mine some more, export more, because you are exporting it in its raw material. But immediately you move to the secondary industry. You are no longer plowing more. You are no longer mining more. You are processing more. So you can produce only what is enough for your processing. And the products you are selling from here are 10, 15, 20 times more expensive than they are sold in their raw material. By the time you come to the tertiary and you're holding a cell phone in your hand, a small little iPhone in your hand, and they're calling that they want $2,000. But to collect how many tons of cotton in, 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 in Congo. So Africa needed to position herself that she needs to start eating. I cannot lie and say we can't afford the tertiary economy right now. Mm -hmm. Tertiary economy would need a dictator like myself to run a country. <laughs> and this is what I would do. I would walk into China tomorrow, I would buy a factory in China and bring it to Zimbabwe and start producing the things that, that for example, the lithium batteries. I will go to China, use the government money and go and buy a full plant in China or get a partnership in China, open a company here. We don't need to be exporting lithium from here to China. It's made into batteries and it is exported back to us, costing us a thousand thousand dollars more. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not sustainable. And, so and African I, I actually saw that it, it, it has happened before, even China itself. I was reading that they actually sold grain in the 1950s, 1960s to Russia, and Russia sold them industrialization. What was the same way that you are talking about? It's the, it's the best way. So what, what we need, we need, a, we need dictators, please, benevolent dictators who are so focused on the agenda. This whole democracy thing is throwing us off the rail because you vote, you vote, you argue on section two, section three, out comrade, out of order. And grown up men like myself sitting in a parliament arguing about section five and subsection 26. What do we need? We need simply to say, what raw materials do we have? Question number one. Number two. What kind of factories can we bring here so that we can create value chains and employment for our children and the, grow our GDP? There is no mathematics. I don't need science and maths. Get them here. Reduce your export of raw material. Increase your beneficiation and production. Your economy will blow through the roof overnight. Yeah, and then now... Would that determine our place as Africa on the issues of global politics, global conflicts? Remember, remember, global politics is driven by commodities. Global politics and global wars are driven by commodities. So it is wheat today in Ukraine. It is oil in Iraq. It is um, cocaine and etc. In the in the, in, the, in the Latin America, it is minerals. Everywhere in Africa, it is diamonds. It is uh, it is it is cotton in in Congo. So it, it's a mineral-driven economy. So until Africa can have its own stock exchange, what do I mean by that? We collect all the materials that we have on Africa, and have our own stock exchange, like the LME in London, where you determine the price of gold. Yet you don't have gold. How arrogant is that? So we we have our gold in Africa. And we determine the price of gold because we have gold. That has happened in Saudi Arabia, where they have oil. And they determine the price of their own oil because it is our oil. You want it, you buy it. You don't want it, don't worry. There's a man behind you who wants to buy it. But Africa right now, we can't even determine the price of cocoa. We can't determine the price of gold. We can't determine the price of lithium or platinum or uranium. So having ourselves organized will then make us equal partners because the bomb that exploded in Hiroshima, the uranium came from Congo. Did you know that? I didn't know. And you actually mean that the time that the bomb exploded in Hiroshima, I think it is in the 1920s, is it? Yes. They were already extracting uranium from Congo. They were already, they were already as busy as ever. 
this year's ever the Benin conference, you talk about the 18 Benin, 18 what, 1846, whatever. It was about Congo, that war of Lu Leopold. It is not actually called the Berlin Conference. The correct word must be the Congo Conference. That conference was based on who will rule over Congo. Because to date, Congo is the richest country in the, in the whole of Africa and beyond the borders. So the exploitation and the extraction never matched the development? It has never, hence Congo has never been at peace. Because as long as people are fighting in Congo, the Western world and the Eastern world, they can fly their private jets and steal things and fly out of the country with no immigration, no borders, no passports, nothing. You, 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 when you are flying over Congo, you just see an airstrip in the midst of nowhere and airplanes and jets going in and out, stealing, literally stealing, in with the help of the, of the liberation movements who get a few guns. So these people bring the guns, they give the... The, the revolutionaries, quote-unquote revolutionaries, then the revolutionaries are shooting each other while the, the, the big boys are extracting and stealing and going away. So we, we need to become participants, partners on the table and then determine the price of our own products and develop our own economy to what we want it to be. We cannot constantly become servants of our own raw material and be told what to do. Now all of a sudden they come around, you can't use coal because it's going to pollute the environment. But they used coal to build their own economies for hundreds of years. The same solar systems they want us to buy, they want to produce those solar systems and sell them to us again and then repair them for us. For how many millions? So we need to find sustainable sources of energy and allow Africa also to grow at a pace it want to grow. And for what it is worth, Africa has not even contributed a significant amount of those carbon gases they're talking about. <laughs> well, well, these issues, they are interrelated. And... I see a lot of African leaders go on those endless conferences, like the ones that President Ruto was actually complaining about. We've seen the humiliating incident where African leaders were actually buzzed at the Queen's funeral. They were not given VIP treatment. So for that sort of humiliation, are we as Africans benefiting from those endless deals, from those endless conferences? Was this visit by the African delegation to Ukraine and Russia? I see it also as a conference or a deal-making visit. It's not really much about peace. Are we seeing the benefit? It's very exciting, and I'm glad. I'm glad they were put on a bus. I, I, if I, I would have put them on a taxi or made them to walk. Because the African, African leaders need to know their value to the Europeans and the Americans. You, we have, they've never respected you. And I don't know why we always spend time trying to kneel in front of these colonial, colonial regimes. Mm. And you think that the fact that you have been invited, you're going to be respected. Here is the whole aeroplane full of security services of Ramaphosa that was grounded in Poland. Diplomatic passports. Bags were opened, guns were confiscated, government to government. Had we done that to any of the European countries, don't you think that would have been war? Or had we done that to the prince of Saudi who came to South Africa with an interest? They come here every day. Prince William comes here. Prince whatever, Charles comes here to Zimbabwe. They walk around our countries for free, for free. I'm not even talking about the Saudi Arabia. The very royal house in Britain, it comes to Zimbabwe here. For holidays in Malilangwe, in, 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 in Lawfield, there, and uh, where their favorite spots are. We have never mistreated them. They are given presidential escorts. They are protected. Airports are blocked for them. They're given first class treatment. But when you go to their country, then they are put behind the bus. Maybe, but maybe they, argue, the right they argue, the Polish authorities, they argue that they were actually carrying weapons which are not uh, classified as just for but, presidential protection. My young, my young man, you need to have studied diplomacy to understand what happens prior to a trip taking place. This is not the first time Ramaphosa is flying out of the country. This is not the first time Ramaphosa has landed in Europe. He was there a few weeks ago at the British uh, inauguration. Come on. Come on. Well, you, went, you went to meet Prince Charles it, when, he was, when he came into power. During inauguration, I think he went to Sudan. Yes, I remember that part. But he has been to Europe many times. So you cannot tell me that this time around in Poland that there is no understanding of protocols as to what must you bring in, what can you not bring in, what kind of guns are brought in, what kind of guns are not brought in, and etc. And of course, the president is moving into a war-torn country. 
There's no way you can expect him to walk there carrying a walking stick when they are supposed to protect a national asset. So, but all those arrangements are not for me to speak and say, I know exactly what was in those containers. Mm -hmm. But for all protocol purposes, it should have been observed before they depart. They declare what they have. They tell the country where they're going, what they have and where they're going to refuel. It was a choice actually to land in Poland. They could have landed in, 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 in Luxembourg. They could have landed in Paris. They could have landed in, in, in wherever. But they decided because of bilateral agreements between countries. So I don't buy that with the, for, for what it is worth. It is a politicking of the highest order. If a president of a country is in the country, he deserves to be treated like a president of a country. Well, the way that's maybe the worst, the Americans, the Europeans, the way that they treat our African president, it creates a picture that they actually don't need Africans. They are actually doing Africans a favor. You would even hear Tendai BT at one time, you would actually say, Zimbabwe should not behave in the way that they behave like the world they owe them anything. If Zimbabwe is deleted from the face of the globe, life will just move on like that. Which means even amongst us as Africans, we have that idea that Europeans or the West, they are doing us a favor, they are negotiating deals, they are uh, giving us donations, they are helping us, we have got nothing to offer. So the African politicians who are coconuts, such as BT, must keep quiet because they don't see themselves as transforming the country. They see themselves as beneficiary of the colonial system. They think that by becoming friends to the whites, they are doing us a favor. Meanwhile, they just want to buy themselves into retirement and be in good books with the rest of the world. It doesn't mean that they're bringing anything. How dare you say that? And you say if Zimbabwe is deleted, where will you be your mother be? Where will your wife be? What will your grandchildren have? How can you speak about your country with such disdain and such disrespect that you don't even consider yourself as a human being on the face of the earth who deserves to be respected? Maybe let me make an announcement to the African presidents. Next time a European or an American president comes here, let's confiscate their guns also. <laughs> let's confiscate them. Yeah, they, that would be an act of war. Let the, president walk, let the president walk out of the airport with no escort. Let's see how that, let's just see that, how it will pan out. You want to we see have, the reaction? So and so, President so and so is landing in landing. You just confiscate the airplane and don't, don't touch him, of course. Let him do what he must do. Keep them there for 24 hours on his way back. Say, take your soldiers and go back. Yeah, because in Poland, they actually grounded the plane that was with the subs officers, the soldiers that were escorting the president. And he was just left with just an ordinary VIP escort into a war raging zone. I even hear some, I didn't know if it is true that he, he had to jump on a train. <laughs> a whole president of a country jumping on a train on his way to Moscow. You know, what kind of embarrassment is that? I mean, to say the least, to say the least, when, when, when these people are fighting, these white boys, when they are fighting, Stay away, black people. Stay away from white men when they fight. Because when you get there, they stop fighting each other and they start fighting you. Or they start mocking you. No, oh, what an embarrassment. And by the way, when, when Europeans are fighting and they're killing each other, who cares? How many people have died so far in Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis how many people have died in Congo so far? It's not worth talking about. So I, I'm, I'm personally not moved. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the African people coming together, creating our own army, creating our own economy, creating our own solidarity as brothers and sisters so that we can be able to deal with African problems and not wait for foreigners to come and solve those problems for us. Jena Bishop, thank you so much for your time. I think for now, let us leave this, this conversation here. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much for inviting me on your, on your space. We'll be talking again soon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching this video. Kindly share, kindly subscribe. So don't miss any of the videos that we share and with that we are out.